So is anybody good at putting things together? All right, we got a couple handy people. I think maybe the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts are scouts. They're getting there, right? Y'all will be there soon where you'll feel confident and competent enough to take a screwdriver or a hammer or a saw and begin to construct something. But if you're anything like me, the extent of my ability to put things together is what comes in a box from Ikea. I love Ikea. Anybody else? Any fans of Ikea? I could walk that store for days, mostly because I get lost in it, right? It is so confusing. I see a bed, I'm taking a nap. But I came across a video from Ikea a couple years back that I wanted to share with you this morning before we dive into the message. So check this out. making a difference in the world. You are beautiful. I brought them here to see the plan. I was like, a plant is getting bullied. Like, it's not normal. I think it's an excellent project to have something tangible that they can actually physically be a part of is I think going to be very powerful. As the weeks passed, I started noticing that the one that was being bullied uh, started kind of to droop. While the plant that was being complimented, it was it was flourishing and beautiful. It's raised the profile massively of different forms of bullying and the effects that bullying can have on people. can definitely affect other people. But that kind of brings me to tears every time I see it. It's amazing. Like I could take this little plant and I could begin to speak words to it. You are beautiful. You are worthy. You are amazing. You are going to flourish and grow and become something that changes the world. And after speaking to this plant for 30 days, it could grow and it could flourish and you could see the life within it because positive words impact that plant, which is kind of weird, right? But at the same time, if I said, you are fake, you are not real, you are ugly, you are dusty, you need to be cleaned, oh my goodness, we shake this thing, it could dwindle and diminish. The life of this plant can either be built up by the words that are spoken to it, or it could be torn down because of the words that are spoken to it. Now, was this a one-off? Did, did Ikea do this experiment and, and skew the numbers in their favor? I'm kind of a numbers guy. So I went and did some research, and according to the Royal Horticultural Society, they did a similar experiment where they took 10 plants and they spoke to them. Five of them were spoken to in a positive nature, five in a negative nature. And then they had a control group of two plants that didn't have anybody speak to them at all. They were all given the same soil, They were all given the same amount of sunlight, the same amount of water. They all had the same exact circumstances surrounding these plants. And what they found are that the ones who were spoken positively to grew on average one inch more than the other plants, with one of the plants reaching almost two full inches of growth. 
The ones that were spoken negatively to in this particular circumstance dwindled, diminished. They did not grow. They did not flourish. Church, if I could tell you anything this morning, it's this. It's that your words are very powerful. Your words are very powerful. They can either give life or they could cause death. They could either build up or they could tear down. One of the most traumatic moments in my life happened when I was a second grader. I was the new kid at a school, which is difficult. We moved around a lot when I was a child. And in second grade, we moved to this little town in Connecticut called Windsor Locks. It's a, a very small community. It's where the airport is. Bradley International or Hartford International Airport is Windsor Locks, Connecticut. And I was the new kid, and I remember the way we would get lunch is that we would get this tray, and we would wait along the wall, and then we would go into the little um, cafeteria room. we put our tray down. They would give us our lunch. We'd come through, and we would be in the gymnasium slash cafeteria of the elementary school. And I remember one particular day, just new. I was already anxious. I didn't know anybody. I was very insecure about my weight, and I just remember like, hey, look at that fat kid. Now, I'm 38 years old. I still hear those words ringing in my ears. You know the statement, sticks and stones may break their bones, but words, how wrong is that? Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words could always hurt you. Some of us have been cut down, broken down, torn down because of the words that have been spoken into us and over us. Others of us have been built up because of the words that have been spoken to us and spoken over us. So church family, again, if I could tell you anything, it's that our words are very powerful. We're continuing in this teaching series entitled Bridge Builders, and it's a series all about unity. Last week we said that as a bridge builder, we're building upon a firm foundation of faith. We said that each and every person, it did not matter the color of our skin, our age, our socioeconomic background, it didn't matter that each and every person who has ever lived, is living, or one day will live is made in the imago dei, the image and likeness of God. That each of you young men and women have been marked by God and made in His image. And we're building upon this firm foundation that because we're all made in this image, that we must recognize that in order to build unity, we must recognize the value of every person we come into contact with. Now listen, adults, for some of us, we, we got this well, right? We've, we've lived life long enough that we've, we've done this. We've seen others and we, we've, we've valued them and we've seen the value in their life. For some of us, we have not done that well. We've not seen the value in other people's lives. So if I could give a word of encouragement to everybody under the age of uh, 21, begin to shape your life now that you see and you recognize the value in other people. So moving forward, you live in such a way that you have a firm foundation of valuing others that you come into contact with. That's where we've been. Here's where we're going today. That you and I are called to be bridge builders. And we build bridges by encouraging one another. We build bridges by encouraging one another. Thus, we build unity when we use our words to to cultivate hope and not hate. We build unity when we use our words to cultivate hope and not hate. So I want to share with us this morning from the perspective of some of our scouts. We've got two students who have been tapped and are going to come up and share a brief little testimony of how they are working on building unity. So I don't know which one of you guys wants to go first, but if you want to flip a coin, rock, paper, scissors, um, run up here first because you're so excited, but whoever would like to go first, y'all see how quick they're moving, right? I'm coaxing them. There we go. Show some love. Here you go, sir. Huh? I was just trying to get out of the. That's all right. I understand. See, this is what I'm talking about. He comes well prepared. All right. Now, here's what you're going to do introduce yourself, 
Make sure everybody knows who you are, and then hop on into it, all right? All right. Hi, I am Nathaniel. I am currently working on getting my tenderfoot rank, and I am here to talk about how the Boy Scouts ties into the church. The Boy Scouts ties into the church in many different ways. While the church is based off of the Ten Commandments, in Boy Scouts we have the Scout Law, a list of things in which Scouts are expected to follow. A Scout is trustworthy. We are trusted not to lie or steal, just like in one of the Ten Commandments. A Scout is loyal, loyal to, um, loyal to your family and loyal to your country, and like the church, loyal to God. A Scout is helpful. We help the church in things like the pumpkin patch or the canned food drive, and the church gives the money and food to the needy. A scout is friendly. We are friendly and welcoming to others, just um, like how the church lets anyone in to attend a service. A scout is courteous. Scouts act, uh, act polite and put on their best behavior for everyone, just like how the church does not separate or segregate people and they treat everyone as equals. A scout is kind, kind to everyone no matter what and, and is never rude to someone like how the church donates food to people in need. A scout is obedient. A scout is obedient to authorities, similar to the, how the church is obedient to the Bible and how the people in the church are obedient to the pastor and God. A scout is cheerful. We try to be as, um, as happy as we can be, like how the church plays songs or has a band perform. A scout is thrifty, saving money where we can, and similarly, the Bible teaches not to put material things first, spiritual things come first. A scout is brave, being afraid to go on things like a long hike or making your own shelter for a camping trip, but still going through with it. And throughout history, Christianity and many other religions had to be brave by standing in what they believe in. A scout is clean, clean physically and clean mentally. The church is clean spiritually. No evil can live in a church. Lastly, and most importantly, a scout is reverent. Reverent to our community, reverent to our country, and like the church and the people in it, reverent to Jesus and God. Thank you. Nathaniel, thank you so much for sharing those words. There is a unity amongst the scouts and the church as we build a relationship with one another. We're in unity upon the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ. And just as Nathaniel shared, each of us is, whether a scout or not, trying to live in such a way that our lives honor and reflect the hope that is found in Jesus. So Nathaniel, thank you so much for those words. And we have one more young man who's going to come up and bless us with uh, his perspective. So make sure you introduce yourself and then dive into it. Y'all probably know me already. Um, my name is Matthew Wolf. I am first class. Um, I've done this for three years in a row. This is my uh, fourth year going on. So how we build each other up in our troop is usually we have some stragglers on some trips. If we're going on a backpacking trip or there's some kids on a camping trip that are just, they don't have the drive to keep going. We just try and build them up the best we can. Like you have the power to do this. You have the strength to do this. You know, I've had some friends having trouble in life and going through a lot of stuff. Sadly, addiction, which is really crazy at that age. And I'll tell my friends, look, you got to pray about it. That's all you can do is pray. Because at this point, you're not, you're not trying to help yourself. So you got to ask God to help you. You have to pray about it. Because say, God, I need help in my situation. I can't do this alone. I can't do this by myself. And I need help. I need help from you. Because you're the only person in my situation that can help me right now. You are the Almighty, you are the one, you are the way. Now we have some other kids in our troop that, like I said, you know, sometimes are straggling and we just encourage them, you know. We try and bring them to God and, you know, we thank the church for everything y'all do for us and we thank y'all for giving us space to have our meetings and, you know, bring kids to God and bring kids to something that keeps them out of trouble and, you know, keeps them from doing bad things. So we appreciate y'all for that, and we thank y'all for speaking to you.
Nathaniel, Matthew, thank you, gentlemen. As, as Matthew said, you know, our reality is similar as adults in our circumstances as it is for them. That all of us have the opportunity to notice those who are around us and speak life into them. And it's encouraging to see that no matter what stage of life our scouts are in, just as no matter what stage of life we find ourselves in, we can always be a positive influence on those who are around us. We can speak life and hope into the life of others around us. But what happens when we struggle and we hit a, hit a roadblock? What happens when we begin to put up walls? Well, we're going to spend a little bit of time reading through a passage of Scripture and unpacking it this morning. So if you have a Bible, I would encourage you, we are in the book of James. If you turn to the middle, hang to the right, towards the end, after the book of Hebrews is the book of James, written by the biological half-brother of Jesus. And James was really insightful. James lived with Jesus for much of his life, saw what Jesus did, went where Jesus went. I heard one um, actually Christian comedian talked about James almost drowned one time. You know, with Jesus walked on water. James didn't walk on water, James. Yeah. He tells it a lot funnier than I do, but anyway. James chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says this, Not many of you should become teachers. That word for teachers are leaders, those who have influence over others, those who make an impact by leading others, influencing others. That's all of us, right? We all have influence over others. But that's a different sermon for a different day. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. But if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ship also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among the members, staining the whole body, setting a fire on the entire course of life, and it is itself set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And I'm, I'm going to pause right there, and I'm going to come back to these other verses in just a moment, if that is okay. We'll pause right here. Because what I want to do with these first few verses is I want to begin to unpack what it looks like when we build walls. James says that we all stumble sometimes. It's funny, there are very many times where we have gone out and we have talked with people and, and I get asked a lot, you know, what do you do? We live in a culture and an age right now where a lot of who we are is defined by what we do. You know, hey, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. I can't go to church. It's filled with hypocrites. You're absolutely right, it is. The church is filled with hypocrites. I hate to say it, but you want to know why it's filled with hypocrites? Because all of us need Jesus. If you were perfect in what you did, if you were perfect in what you said, you would be able to control your whole body, control the whole direction of your life. You would be in complete control of everything. But newsflash, control is an illusion. 
Control is like going to the beach, grabbing a handful of sand and squeezing as hard as you can, saying, I'm going to hold on to all of this. Do you know what happens the harder you squeeze the sand? The more of it that slips through your fingers. Andy Stanley says control is like a bar of soap. The more of it you flex, the less of it you have. Control is an illusion. But what we find is that if we recognize the fact that each and every one of us stumbles, we can begin to understand how we can navigate around by the grace of God to live as those who are not building walls, but instead are building bridges. So we build walls when we stumble and we allow our tongue to direct our body. We stumble, we put up walls when we allow our tongue to direct our body. James says that we boast great things. So what does this mean? This means for some of us, we boast great things about ourselves. We talk very highly about ourselves. We think very much about ourselves, and we want to let everybody else know around us just how awesome we are. We boast great things, and this becomes problematic when all we do is talk about us. It puts walls up between us and other people. Have you ever had that one friend who was so fixated and infatuated with themselves that every time you talk to them, all they ever do is tell you how great they are? I have a near and dear friend, and we we butt heads sometimes, but I'll give you an example. I put a picture up on my social media, on my Facebook the other day, of my daughter doing karate. And this friend of ours didn't say, you know, how awesome that it is that Kayla's doing karate. How, how did it go? Did she pass her test? What they put up was, hey, my son loves karate. And it was one of those subtle things that you begin to realize that this person is so fixated with themselves that they can't recognize the good in somebody else. All they can do is talk about themselves. We stumble when we put up walls between us and others because we boast about ourselves. Being prideful is like setting the world around us on fire in order to tell everybody else how awesome we are. This is very different than what John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, said. He said that we should all set ourselves on fire for the Lord so that others may come and watch as we burn for Jesus, not for ourselves. We go on and we realize that we tend to speak in unrighteous ways. Anybody in here guilty of this? Johan, just kidding. It's funny, I, I hang out with people who are near and dear to me who don't do church. You know, church is far from their mind, and they, they, the expression is they cuss like sailors. And it's always funny when the pastor walks in the room and they're like, hey, man, brother. And then I walk in and it's like, I'm sorry, I can't talk like that. The pastor's here. Please believe me, I've heard every word that you can say. I may have said them even myself. We culturally have dictated what words are appropriate, what words are not appropriate. But James's point is the heart behind the words we say. It might not be the word itself, and I, I, I'm going to curse right now. Please forgive me. I'm going to use one that, that may, some of you might giggle, but it's actually in the Bible. If you look in those King James Bibles, it's right there. It's the word ass, right? We in society t- today say, like, this is a bad word. We can't say that. But what does the Bible mean when it says it? Donkey. Right? We've contextualized, we've given it a different meaning, a different purpose, and we have said that this is unrighteous and unholy and ill speech. James's point is that for some of us, it's not just the words we say, but it's the content behind it. Think about it again with the plant. You're ugly. You're worthless. You can't lead us well. You don't know what you're doing. Those might not be the profane words we think of, but these words that we speak can tear somebody down. James says that when we speak in an unrighteous way, it's wickedness, and it comes forth from our mouths because it's a reflection of our heart. So church, how's your heart? If what's coming out of your mouth is ill, 
There's something going on deep within. We need to get right with Jesus. Because if our mouths are speaking in an unrighteous way, it's because our heart is set on things that are not good. Now, second, we build walls when we stumble and we allow selfish ambition and bitter envy to reside within our hearts. James says that every man thinks of themselves more than others. This happens when we desire, first and foremost, the things that are best for us. This is securing our own well-being at the cost of anybody else. What happens, what happens when we desire to place ourselves before everybody else? What happens when we desire to place ourselves before everybody else? It's not going to work very well. Anybody in here currently married or ever been married? Okay. Without pointing at your spouse, without jabbing them, um, what would happen if all you ever did was think about you in your relationship? How well would it turn out? Not, not well at all, right? If I never thought about my, my wife, Carrie, and Carrie never thought about me, we would be two people cohabitating in the same house. We would be roommates, not lovers. Hey, it's Valentine's Day tomorrow. Word of advice, if you're married, dating, engaged, want to be, uh, think not only of your own interests, but think also of the interests of your spouse, of your boyfriend, of your girlfriend. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. It's actually right there. It's what Paul says to the church. So we build walls when we stumble and we allow selfish ambition and bitter envy to reside within our hearts. We do this by not showing compassion. Bitter is extremely hazardous. It's hazardous to our health. Lastly, we build walls when we stumble by relying on the wrong wisdom. The wrong wisdom is earthly wisdom, James says, and we're about to look at this right now. And it does not come from above. So let's finish up with verse 13 uh, through 18. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, is unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is pure and peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So church family, we're not meant to build walls. We're not meant to use our words to put up walls. We're not meant to use our words to tear down others. We're not meant to, in the same breath, build somebody up and curse somebody. We're not meant to have the speech that reflects the enemy. We're not meant to live with uncontrolled speech. No, we've been called to be bridge builders. So for you and I today, it's time to tame the tongue. And the younger we start, the more control we gain, God willing, the better it will be for us the longer we live. It's time to start today. It's time for us to control our speech. It's time for us to build one another up. So here in James, we're reminded that we're all called to mature in faith. The more we mature, the more we can build each other up. So I want to leave you with two last thoughts, and as we do, I'm going to invite our band to come back up this morning. As they come back up, my final two thoughts for us are this. How do we mature in faith? Well, we mature in faith when we turn to the wisdom from above to help us control our speech. So Matthew made a great point when he was up here earlier that... We can't do this on our own. 
I can't control my tongue on my own. I can't control it by myself. This week, I, I had a, a dog trainer come in. I, I've shared in uh, past couple sermons that I've been um, having some difficulty with this brand new adopted dog. So finally, we, we, we were having a come to Jesus moment in my family. It's either the dog gets trained or I leave. Like, it's just, there is no, just kidding, just kidding. It was, Kayla would have to leave, right? But we brought this dog trainer to the house, and the dog trainer came, and she had this special collar that she put around the, the neck of the dog, up by her ears, and when you give it just tiny little tug, it goes click, 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 and you hear it, but the whole point of it is that if you can control the head of the dog, you can control the direction of the dog. You see, if we can control the tongue, we can control actions, and our tongue represents what is in our hearts. So let's drill it down. If our hearts are right with God, out of our hearts will flow a mouth that blesses others, speaks with sweetness, adds salt to circumstances, does not tear down but builds up. We must trust in the wisdom from above that comes down from Jesus. It's the ever-present reality of the Holy Spirit residing within us. And when this wisdom from above shows up, it's pure. You speak in purity. It's peace-loving. You speak out of love with peace. It's gentle. It does not intend to maliciously do harm. It's compliant. It's full of mercy. It's unwavering and it's without pretense. That when we trust in God for the wisdom that comes from above, we can control our tongue through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And second, when wisdom from above comes down, it will change the way we act. When wisdom from above comes down, not only will we control our tongue, but it will change the way we act. It will help us to live in peace. You want unity as a bridge builder? We live in peace with one another by building each other up and not tearing each other down. You want peace in your life? We trust in the wisdom from above. It's also not selfish. It's not envious. Because the wisdom from above will force us to cultivate a life that is dependent upon Jesus. So for you and I today, as we go, may we root our hearts and our lives in the truth that is found that by the grace of God, we can control our mouths. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day that you've blessed us with. Lord, as we know that every good and perfect gift that comes from you today, we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit to reside within us so that we would not build walls that we would not stumble in the things we say, stumble with envy, stumble with bitterness, stumble with the wrong wisdom, but that God, our hope and our lives would be firmly rooted and placed in You. So Lord, this morning, would You begin to stir our affections for You so that in this day, in this age, we might leave as those who are changed as those who know that our words are meant to give life and not cause death. So help us to build others up, not to break others down. Salt our words with the grace that comes from Jesus. For it's all in your name that we pray. And the church said,